American Heart Association 71st Scientific Sessions, held November 8 through 11, 1998, in Dallas, Texas. Plenary Session 4, The Vulnerable Atherosclerotic Plaque, chaired by Claude Lafont and Martha N. Hill, with Rene G. Favolaro, Valentin Fuster, Stephen E. Nissen, and Peter Libby. The first Paul Dudley White International Lecture was given at the American Heart Association Scientific Sessions in 1967. This lecture honors the memory of a highly acclaimed pioneer cardiologist and one of the founders of the American Heart Association. Honoring Dr. White with an international lecture is particularly fitting because of his dedication to improving the cardiovascular health of people throughout the world. The Paul Dudley White International Lecture is presented by a distinguished research scholar from outside the United States. Today we will hear Dr. Rene Favoloro from Buenos Aires, Argentina. Dr. Favoloro's story is an exciting and inspiring one. At a very young age, this grandson of Italian immigrants accompanied his uncle, who was a general practitioner, on his daily rounds. This exposure spurred him to consider a career in medicine. Dr. Favoloro received his secondary education and a bachelor's degree at the famous Collegio Nacional of La Plata. He then began his studies in the medical science faculty of La Plata University, where he graduated as a doctor of medicine in 1949. From early in his career, Dr. Favoloro's primary interest was thoracic surgery. The political climate in Argentina at the time, however, led him to resign his hospital post rather than sacrifice his principles of ethical and academic freedom. Circumstances led him to fill in for a doctor who practiced in a small town in the province of La Pampa. He stayed there for more than a decade, improving the quality of health care in the area and practicing preventive medicine. Dr. Favolaro also developed his own operating room and trained general and surgical nurses. Throughout these years, Dr. Favoloro never lost his interest in thoracic surgery. And when he heard of new techniques of open heart surgery, he decided to go to the Cleveland Clinic for further study. While there, Dr. Favoloro developed a friendship with Mason Soans, the father of coronary sineo angiography. Dr. Soans taught him to read and interpret coronary and ventricular images. At that time, myocardial revascularization was limited to the indirect technique of Weinberg and patch reconstruction of occluded coronary arteries. Dr. Favoloro anticipated that the obstructions could be bypassed using the patient's own saphenous vein to connect the unoccluded proximal and distal sections of a vessel, and he pioneered the subsequent evolution of coronary artery bypass surgery. With the resulting success of this procedure, Direct revascularization was soon replaced by that of the aortocoronary bypass. And with additional progress being made, the Cleveland Clinic team became widely known for its successes. Dr. Favoloro returned to Argentina in 1971, where he helped train a new generation of cardiovascular surgeons. By 1980, he had helped establish a medical center and a teaching unit. He then established the Favoloro Foundation to finance basic research, now known as the Institute for Cardiology, Cardiothoracic Surgery, and Organ Transplantation. Dr. Favoloro is a member of 23 learned societies, a corresponding member of three others, and an honorary member of 28 more. He has received 23 significant international awards. I now give you Dr. Favoloro, whose lecture is titled, The Paul Dudley White Revival. Dr. Rene Favoloro. <clears throat> Dr. Hill, I would like to express my deepest appreciation for your kind introduction. You know how much I respect you as a person and as a scientist. Uh, gracias, muchas gracias. Paul D. White was born in 
Roxbury, Massachusetts, June 6, 1986. He graduated from Harvard Medical School in 1911 and became a house officer at the Massachusetts General Hospital the same year. An important landmark in his life was his trip to London in 1913, where he studied under Sir Thomas Lewis. He returned to the Massachusetts General in 1914. He became instructor in medicine at Harvard Medical School in 21. He was a member of the founding group of the American Heart Association and became its president from 51 to 53. He was also founding member of the International Council of Cardiology in 46, and the same year he was nominated its president. He was able also to preside the International Society of Cardiology from 54 to 58. And in 1957, he founded the International Society of Cardiology Foundation. Dr. White wrote 12 books and about 758 scientific articles. He won hundreds of well-deserved awards. He always kept an open mind to new development. On his return from England, he brought with him the exciting new electrocardiograph developed by Enthoven. He was the first to utilize it in USA for clinical research. I met him in London during the Secret Congress of Cardiology for the first time, where I had the discussion with Charlie Friedberg on the early development of CABG. After the discussion, I had the chance to speak with him briefly. I also had the pleasure to participate in a symposium in his honor in December 1971 in New York. On that occasion, I had the privilege to sit next to him and inter-exchange ideas and friendship for more than an hour. He talked about his trip to Latin America, and especially one in Argentina. At 85, his mind was clear, and he looked in good health in spite of his having a heart attack in 1970. I was impressed by his remark and judgment, but even more by his humility and modesty. If we analyze his life carefully, we will realize that Paul D. White left an important legacy for all of us. First message, the clinical history stands above any technological advances. In 1925, Paul D. White had two chief interests, the practice of medicine and clinical research. He truly believed that the clinical record stands above any technological advances, starting with the interview. Listen to what the patient can tell you. It may be more important than anything else, else you do. He repeatedly emphasized to his student. Besides giving his patient a chance to describe the history of their illness and the symptoms in their own words, he also had the valuable opportunity to observe the psychological implication and the characteristic of each personality. Afterwards, he performed a careful and detailed clinical examination. The second message, all patients are equal. Among Paul D.Y. patients, there were many of the greatest names of the 20th century. Presidents, politicians, businessmen, writers, artists, bishops, prominent physicians and scientists. However, most of his patients were ordinary people. One of his former students, Dr. Schaff, watched him delivering the best care that he could for anybody and everybody, from the President of the United States to the poor little lady coming in from the clinic. Everybody was equally welcome. He treated them as gentlefolk, not as keen, not as pauper, but with universal humanity, which obviously sprang from the heart. Third message, team effort. In this era of market individualism, this is another important message that goes beyond medicine. Dr. Craig, who trained with Dr. White, emphasized, I was always struck by his concern for each member of the professional team, as well as the other employee, mates, nutritionists. He had some good words for the nurses who were there and encouraged them to renew efforts on behalf of the patient. Four message, respect for the physician, particularly for the referring doctors. All along his life, he relates easily and warmly to other doctors. His criticism was always constructive. Because of his experience and knowledge, he was consulted frequently by the patients and their own physician. Dr. Craig clearly described Dr. White's relation with the referent physician. Not infrequently, the case had been mismanaged or at least drastic alteration 
in the program were urgently indicated. In his conversation with the referring physician, Dr. White will avoid any hint of censure for what had been done to that point. Fifth message, modest fees. Paul DeWay was always modest in his fees. His records show that in December 1943, his charges vary from $15 to $35. On December 6, 1963, they went from $5 to $25. They were so modest that they upset some of his young collaborators. To very wealthy patients, he suggests a generous check to be given to a worthy medical cause. Sixth message, clinical teaching and clinical research. All the white life has always been closely related to his patient. The practice of medicine constitutes the prerequisite for his teaching and clinical research. His teaching was done at the bedside of a patient in the Massachusetts General or in the conference room at the basement of the Balfish Building on the Massachusetts Hospital. At the beginning, only America recently graduated. Doctors took part, but as, gain, but as he gained prestige, more and more young physicians came to Boston from all over the world. His teaching also comprised the innumerable lectures he gave in America, mainly through the American Heart Association and his countless commitment abroad. He developed a great amount of time on public education and urged widespread support for the American Heart Association Heart Disease Prevention Cause. He was in enormous demand as a speaker. He appeared in different places throughout the country and in the most important American television program. Seven message, prevention. Undoubtedly, Paul DeWay's greatest contribution to mankind was his prescription for a healthy way of life. The central component of his philosophy was the emphasis on the value of regular physical activity. He began to speak about the positive benefit of physical exercise in the late 20s. He wrote, walking is probably the best exercise because it's easy for anyone to accomplish and easy to grade from the slowest walk to the most rapid and longest. The value of bicycle, which was one of his favorite forms of exercise, was mentioned already in 1937. He opened many bicycle paths, including a pioneer one in Chicago in 56. He also encouraged stair climbing instead of elevators. There are many, and some of them beautiful anecdotes in this regard. On one occasion, he climbed to the 13th floor for a press conference at the National Press Club, arriving as fresh as could be while the reporters collapsed into chairs. His propensity for walking or bicycling rather than riding in a car and then climbing a stair rather than using the elevator became legendary. If we were in mind, that in his structure for a healthy life, he included the control of hypertension and obesity, the opposition to cigarette, and the moderate use of alcohol. We realized that he was a pioneer in the promotion of prevention and rehabilitation of heart patients. Eight mission, eight message, humanitarianism. His innumerable trips overseas were ostensibly for lectures and teaching. However, his underlying purpose was to promote friendship and understanding between scientists in all parts of the world so as to contribute usefully to a better climate, climate for global progress in medicine as well for the maintenance of world peace. At the opening session of the First World Congress of Cardiology in Paris, he said, we who are, who are medicine to care will also like to perform the miracles of healing the troubled world of today by a universal bond of a spiritual brotherhood and medicine from the heart. Following this policy, Paul De White made six trips to Russia between 61 and 66. He always supported democracy and freedom, even at difficult circumstances. Nine message, disarmament and peace. During the years of Cold War, he openly fought for peace. Although he had a strong political disagreement with the Russians after so many trips, they eventually started to trust him. In 1961, he became the first American to be elected to the Academy of Medical Science in Russia. In Leningrad, in 64, he said, why can Russia and Americans sign further agreement as they have already done with at least some success for health and some of the art and sciences? Though often too meagerly and too slowly, 
against other common enemies in the world which can lead to war which include hunger, poverty, ignorance, and unhappiness without forcing ourselves on people who do not need or want help, then it should not be a surprise that he attend the World Congress for General Disarmament and Peace in Moscow in the mid of 1960 and that he went to China in 1971. The final message is optimism. Optimism is part of a positive attitude toward life. Referring to the attribute of optimism in medicine, in 1951, he wrote, it is quite certain that biological effects also result from cheerfulness, optimism, courage, and joy. A chance to counteract the harmful effects of pain, sorrow, and hunger is possible through the inculcation of a happy disposition. We know that clinical, there are definite effects from the application of this idea. Helpful psychotherapy and the best practice of medicine depend on this considerable part. Let's talk now about the practice of medicine in America. Following the principle of American society, the practice of medicine in this country was accomplished without regulation and with absolute freedom. Patients were able to select their doctors and hospitals, and the charges were the consequence of this relationship. Fee-for-service established the parameters of health care. Medicine could not avoid the influence of the technological revolution. Slowly and steady, we benefit from the incorporation of new tools that allow us to improve the diagnosis and treatment of our patients. This tool had a tremendous impact in our field in cardiology and cardiovascular surgery. The pharmaceutical industry also has contributed enormously, enormously to enlarge our armamentarium. Undoubtedly, we have been able to improve the quality of life of our citizens and increase the overall life expectancy to 76 years. But all these advantages have been very costly. We cannot deny that the fee-for-service method of payment is primarily responsible for the enormous escalation of healthcare expenditure in the United States, from 5% of GDP in 1960 to 14% in 1995. Following five years of near stability, health spending is expected to rise one more as a share of gross domestic product beginning in 1998, climbing from 13.6% in 1996 to an estimated 166 by 2007. By 2010, the healthcare expenditures are projected at 18% of the GDP. Physicians have been responsible for 75% of the healthcare expenditure. During my stay in this country until 1971 and my continuous traveling in subsequent years, I have, been medic med I have seen medical practice being highly rewarded. All the fellows I train or we train at the Cleveland Clinic who are making large amounts of money even practicing at community level. In the 60s, healthcare was not yet called an industry. However, by the mid to late 80s, it had been the nation's largest industry, almost a trillion dollar a year, of course, with some deleterious effect. Number one, the diagnosis is based mainly in the utilization of sophisticated technology. I agree with Sonner I and Spody when they state that many, if not most, cardiological diagnoses would be made by use of patient history, physical examination, and supplemented by simple non-invasive procedures. However, a nationwide investigation of trainees in internal medicine and cardiology and third-year medical students demonstrated that the proficiency of bedside cardiac auscultation was seriously degraded. Programs with the structured teaching in auscultation exist only in 27% of medicine and 37% of cardiology programs. Contemporary teaching rounds often take place in the conference room and not at the bedside. Internal medicine topics are taught during lunch hour in conference room. And number two, the complex relationship between the physician and the pharmaceutical and technological industry, called by Relman the medical industrial complex, left aside some ethical concerns. The profuse utilization of randomized trials supported by the industry 
with the help of complicated mathematical formulas, deserve my criticism frequently. Analyze this fact, I analyzed this fact in one of my recent publications. In the last World Congress of Cardiology, and I am sad to read this paragraph, in the last World Congress of Cardiology, held recently in Rio de Janeiro, 39 symposiums were organized by pharmaceutical companies. By sheer coincidence, each one of them dealt with subjects related to the pharmaceutical formulas of the organizing company. One thing is to support a Congress, another matter is to organize a symposium. Managed care. Managed care is defined, as you know, as many systems that manage the delivery of health care in such a way from that the cost is controlled. While much of the public, the public thinks of managed care as a relatively recent phenomenon, in reality it is nearly 100 years old. As Lester Brock pointed out, the early plans were socialistic in their approach, with little, if any, grasp of the potential for profiting from their plans, a marked contrast with many of today's plans. The number of participants was small at the beginning and increased steadily, mainly in the last 10 years. The percentage of employees enrolled in managed care plan rose from 25% in 87 to 75% in 96. In 1996, 149 million Americans were enrolled in managed care plans. And by 1997, there were 160 million enrollees. Managed care comprised, as you know, a variety of organizations. Currently, the employees in managed care are enrolled mainly in HMO, PPOs, and POS. It is undeniable that managed care has indeed reduced costs, and it has been produced some salutary effects. Patients stay in the hospital for fewer days. Many surgical procedures are now safely performed in day surgery. Many medical practice, mainly diagnostic tests, have been standardized, simplifying their utilization. There is a greater focus on health promotion and disease prevention, and more attention in the management of chronic disease. Even though a large portion of the healthcare delivery system is still under non-profit control, in the fast-growing HMO sector, nearly 70% are investor-owned, profit being the most important aim. Faceless investors look for return on equity based on the profitable manipulation of the interaction between the healthcare provider and the healthcare consumer. Thus, healthcare is subjected to the same pressure that face any other business. The companies compete to report favorable results to shareholders with substantial margin, 20 to 30 percent, even though they are coming down a little bit. Some contend that the large fraction of healthcare revenue that is spent on marketing, administration and profit is what would be expected as in any business. Thus, a chief executive of a profit HMO can be paid as much as $16 million a year in salary and stock option. As we know, in the managed care system patient, the patient lost their freedom to choose their doctors. The primary care physician or gatekeeper determines whether the patient will be granted further access to the healthcare system, including referral to specialists and diagnostic tests. The doctor-patient relationship, always considered the basis of our profession, has been subverted by the demands of managed care. Many physicians, as Cassidy pointed out, may not always be the patient's advocate. When this distracting relationship is not present, something irreplaceable, unique, and always decidable in our daily duties is lost. Each health insurance plan determines different exclusions and limitations. As we know, incentives that encourage doctors to practice costs effectively include risk sharing, performance-related payment, and bonuses and withhold. It is necessary to remark that some doctors receive bonuses at the end of the year according to the indication of medical services. The less care they provide, the bigger bonus they got. The plans often include confidentiality clauses, better known as gag rule or gag clauses, between managed care organizations and contracted physicians that limit 
the physician responsibility to communicate freely with their patient. An MA study of 200 HMO physician contracts found gap clauses in almost every contract. Nevertheless, due to the public restlessness, some managed care organizations have dropped several restrictions. In relation to managed care, a physician may experience at this moment hunger, denial, depression, negotiation, and finally, resignation. Public concern, discontent, and disrupt have grown as enrollees became increasingly aware of the stupendous profit-oriented practice of their managed care plans and the restriction that limit their health care obligation. The corollary in the public concern is that more than 1,000 bills affecting managed care plans were introduced in a state legislature during the first six months of 1996, and more legislative intervention can be expected. It, it is hoped that the Congress measure will also improve the quality of health care by the managed regulation system. Several studies have tried to measure the health outcome of patients in managed care against patients in the fee-for-service plan. I confess I reviewed many of them. They have found largely mixed results. Virtually any position one would want to take on their attributes can be currently supported by the literature. The main reason for the discrepancy lies in the difficult to obtain an adequate evaluation of quality. Even the Hades 3O study supported by the National Committee for Quality Assurance failed to reach conclusive results. The methods we have for measuring quality of service are still quite primitive. What will happen in the future? Certainly, we cannot go back backward, but no new system will succeed unless it encourages doctors to function as trustworthy advocates for their patients. An influence by the economic interest of the owner of the plans while still responsible to legitimate cost consent. Casider firmly believes that to survive, managed care plans will have to show that they have become better citizens, that they care about more than profit, that they do not scheme on care, that they support the just share of teaching, research, and the care of the poor, that they no longer muscle physician and that they offer something especially, including control of cost by managing care. The guidelines that distinguish our profession from a business or craft will contribute to the moral foundation of any healthcare system and will prevent us from treating our patients as non-human, as statistics, as commodities, or as exchangeable pieces within a large profitable structure. The correction of inefficiency and the elimination of unnecessary expenses, both in fee-for-service and managed care modalities, should not be achieved at the expenses of degrading our profession. As Ever Coop remarked, the greatest challenge is to guarantee access to the basic health care for everybody according to the tenets of the Hippocratic Oath. I will do no harm to my patients, and I will follow that system or regime, which according to my ability and judgment, I consider for the benefit of my patient, and abstain from whatever is deleterious and mischievous. And to overcome the tenets of the hypocritic oath, I will do no harm to the corporate bottom line, and I will follow that system or regime in which, according to my ability and judgment, I consider for the benefit of my patron. When our discussion addressed the increasing medical costs, we pay little attention 